Arsenal gun shop and range is Emily Miller of the Washington Times. Ms. Miller, I don't know if you just heard that caller talking about women and guns. Did you have a response for him? Well, I, I'll say I only shot a gun for the first time about a year ago, and to, this month is my one-year anniversary of being a gun owner, so I'm new to it. And I understand, you know, the first time out of range was scary, and um, it's loud. I'm sitting here at a range right now at Blue Ridge, and it's loud. Um, but, you know, like any skill, you learn, you, you know, train, and be responsible. And um, now I'm much better and feel very confident in having a loaded gun in my home. Emily Miller, what is Emily Gets Her Gun? It was a series I did for the Washington Times when I decided to get a gun for my own self-defense in Washington, D.C. Why did you decide to get a gun? Well, I was a victim of a home invasion. I was dog-sitting for friends at a house in Washington, and I'd taken the dog for a walk and, not very smartly, left the front door unopened. Or, I'm sorry, opened, closed, but unlocked. And I came back, and there was a man coming out of the house. And... Um, to make a long story short, he did not physically harm me, but he did steal my wallet, got away, and I also not very smartly followed him down the street, having watched too many episodes of Law and Order in my life, thinking I was going to get a photo, and when I turned the corner, I found him with about 15 other men in two pickup trucks, alone on a cul-de-sac, and then I knew I was really in danger, so I ran back into the house. Uh, the police said, you know, their biggest concern at that point was that they, the bad guys, because I'd spooked them and come home early, had left the windows or door open somewhere so they would come back that night. And I was just absolutely terrified sleeping in this house alone. And all I had to do was just barricade myself in the bedroom, literally put a dresser in front of the door. And I just thought as I was lying there, if I had a gun by the night table, at least if these crazy drug addict bad guys came back, I have a chance to defend myself against them. And uh, so then I decided to get a gun and found out very quickly that getting a gun in D.C. is one of the hardest things you can do and uh, I, I believe unconstitutional in the way they've set up the registration requirements. What did it cost you? How long did it take? What were some of the biggest obstacles that you faced? It took me from the time I started to the time I actually took possession of my SIG four months and $435 in fees. And that's not including the cost of the gun. So obviously it's prohibitively expensive for most residents of Washington. It's expensive for me, I'll tell you. Um, the and how much was the gun? The $780, I want to say. Okay. Um, and so it was quite an investment. And uh, the, the hardest part was there's this thing, this requirement at the time, this gun safety class, which was five hours long. And you could not teach it in the city because it required an hour at the range, so you had to leave the city. And there were really no restrictions. It was open-ended on who could teach it, where they could teach it. It was always all these men teaching it in their homes. It made me feel very unsafe. I couldn't find an instructor. Um, and in the end, the city council, because of reading all this, exposing all this kind of stuff that the city did to make it virtually impossible for people to get guns in the city, the city council passed a law last year that took away that requirement, that five-hour class, and a couple other small requirements, but there's still 11 steps to gun ownership in Washington, which is only down from 17 when I did it. Emily Miller, who is Charles Sykes, and what's his role in the gun buying process in D.C.? Well, Charles Sykes is the one legal gun dealer in Washington, D.C., and he's been doing it for years. He does not buy and sell. He has a very unique role, which is transferring the guns, because federal law says you have to have a gun transferred to a federal licensed dealer in your state, in D.C., not a state, but same rules apply. So in order to have a handgun, you have to go through Charles Sykes. Obviously, if you're buying a new one, if you own one and you move into the city, you don't need to use him. Well, Charles Sykes got zoned out of his office a couple of years ago and had no place to go, and so the city residents had no way to get legal handguns. And the deal that was finally made under threat of lawsuit was that he could work out of the DMV, so he now have a gun dealer in the DMV um, where you go, and you, I go there, I went there, I think, three or four times total to have my gun transferred to him, fill out the paperwork, at that time, I had to get a ballistics test from his office, but he's the man to call if you want to get a gun in D.C. Uh, why did you choose to buy a SIG? And what is a SIG? Um, 
<laughs> a Sig Sauer is just a brand, just like Glock or Beretta or Colt, Remington, you know, these are all just brands. Um, and I, I went to, it's a little bit harder when you live in Washington because there are no gun ranges. And I think most people, when they decide what gun to buy, they spend a lot of time trying different guns. You can rent them at gun stores like here at Blue Ridge Arsenal. You can rent guns and try them out at the shooting range behind me. And that's a way so you can get a sense <coughs> of how it feels. I wasn't able to do that as well. I did it one time because there's no real, there's only one convenient uh, gun range and it's uh, sharpshooters in Lorton, Virginia. So I narrowed it down to five. I knew I wanted a full-size gun because there are no carry rights in DC, so I couldn't take the gun out of my house. So I narrowed down to full size to five, and we put up a poll in the Washington Times and let people vote. And they chose the Sig Sauer, it's a P229. And um, because I did care about the looks of it, I got the stainless steel two-tone, so it looks pretty cool too. And uh, we have a tweet here from Sasha who asks, how often has Emily practiced in the last year since you got your gun? I go about every once a month, every once every month or two to the range and uh, train with my gun. What are the restrictions in Washington, D.C. when it comes to you taking your gun out of your house? Well, Washington, D.C. is the last place in the country where it is illegal to bear arms. That half of the Second Amendment is not recognized in our nation's capital. In December, uh, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals overturned Illinois state law, which also had that same provision that you couldn't leave your house with your gun. And so their state legislature has 180 days to rewrite that law in order to allow people to bear arms. So now it, it remains that D.C. is the only place in the country where you can't take your gun out of your home. As a result, the only people who have guns on the streets of Washington are the bad guys. And that's why assaults with guns were up 20% last year in Washington, D.C. Violent crime is up, I think it was up 3 to 6% in the total by the end of the year. I'm not exactly sure because the police took down their crime statistics website as I started reporting on violent crime going up while it's going down the rest of the country. Um, but it's, it's the last place and it's what has to be overturned by the court eventually because it is not safe nor is it constitutional to have the bad guys, the only ones with the guns, and have all the law-abiding people as sitting ducks. And carry laws more than anything are great to turn to crime because the bad guys know that there's a chance you're going to shoot back. They're probably not going to target you. Why? That's why, as Larry Pratt said earlier, Violent crime one mile away across a bridge in Virginia is so much lower because the bad guys know if they want your iPhone in D.C., there's very little chance that you're going to have a gun to be able to shoot back when they grab you and want your phone. Emily, Whereas in Virginia, there's that question mark. Emily Miller, as a reporter, uh, how long have you investigated buying an illegal weapon in D.C. and how long that would take you? Peter, I wanted to do that so badly. Um, but unfortunately, we've not been able to find a way, even the smartest investigative minds of the Washington Times, to find a way to do it that would either, one, not put my life at risk, and two, not have me break the law. So I really don't know, but I can just look at the crime statistics when the police decide to put them back online and see that, you know, the guns are being stolen, they're being bought off the streets, and there's plenty of gun crime, there's plenty of guns being bought and sold in this city. It's just not the law-abiding people. Emily Gets Her Gun is the name of the series in the Washington Times. If you go to the WashingtonTimes.com, you can just type in her name and this uh, blog will come up. It uh, goes over the course of six or seven months or so. You can see it right there on your screen. She joins us from Blue Ridge Arsenal in Chantilly, Virginia. You're hearing some noise in the background. The range is open, the store is open, so that's what you're hearing in the background. David in Shalimar, Florida, you've been very patient. Please go ahead with your question or comment for Emily oh, Miller. Yes. yes, sir, how you doing? Good. Uh, basically, what's kind of odd here is I'm a convicted felon and I own three guns. It was very easy for me to purchase these guns. I've been a convicted felon since 1998. I've purchased these guns back in 2010. Uh, the laws, you know, I'm all for some laws. But when it comes to firearms for, like, people that's trying to protect their family like me, my guns stay at home. I'm not out wanting to hurt nobody. They're for protection. I know a lot of criminals. I've been to prison. And when they come into someone's home, they're going to do what they got to do to get what they want. 
and they're they're not going to care oh well this person has got this or got that you know they're going to come in fully loaded armed ready to get the job done hey. and i feel like everybody has the right to protect their home under any and all circumstances hey david uh, could we ask you just a couple quick questions what what kind of felony was it what was the uh, felony charge i have a bunch of some minor theft felony in my younger days i do have an aggravated battery with great bodily harm on my record i am considered a violent felon uh, again, that's pre-kid days when I was wild and out of control. Okay, and when you bought your guns, did you go through a gun shop? No. Did you buy them what would be considered illegally? Yes. So, now, how, I mean, if I could have been able to legally buy a gun through the gun shop, even as a legal felon, trust me, I would have done that. You know, and the police would know, hey, this guy's got such and such gun. So if I ever did commit a crime, they would say, hey, do you got that gun? Show me that gun for ballistics. And if I can't pr produce that gun, that's more circumstantial evidence that they would have against me. You know, basically, I got my guns from Texas. I live in Florida, in Texas. It took me four days from the time that I met someone here in Florida for them to go out into Mexico, bring the firearms from Mexico into Texas, and I purchased them there. David in Chalamar, Florida, thanks for sharing your story. Emily Miller. Um, um, I'm a little taken aback by that caller. Um, there's, you know, we have as a society agreed on some limits to the Second Amendment, and we all agree that convicted felons should not be possessing or owning guns. You know, it's very hard to stop the stolen guns, and that's what most criminals have. We agree that people who are mentally ill should not have guns. People who have are assaulting or have restraining orders against them should not have guns. You know, those are agreed upon, and I think that's part of public safety. Um, it's, it's, this, this caller more than anything illuminates what is going on. You know, the president is calling for this universal background check, and the, gu the criminals, and no offense to their caller because he said it was in his past and he's living a law-abiding life now. However, you know, most of these active criminals are just going to buy their guns however they can illegally, and all the checks and all the laws in the world do nothing to stop them. And it's been proven over and over in government studies that there are no gun control laws that have ever been proven to reduce crime. Extensive study by the CDC for two years looked at every law on the national, local, and state level and proved that there's nothing that will reduce crime. So, you know, I think that caller really helps illuminate how those who are, we've already decided should not own firearms are getting them anyway. Pedro Echeverria is also out at Blue Ridge Arsenal. Good morning, Pedro. Uh, so we've been talking about background checks all morning. We're going to walk through the process with you. Mark Warner, it starts with a form. What's this form we're looking at? Here we have a state form and a federal form. A buyer is required to uh, provide two documentations, one the driver's license, and second form of ID had the same address. Um, they felt the state form, they felt the federal form. We put our information into it. Um, on the federal form is here, the information where the, where the firearm is going in as far as make, mile, serial number. Um, from that point there, we go to the computer state, state police computer. But before we go to the computer, some of the things, the questions asked, are you a fugitive from justice? Are you an unlawful user of addicted to marijuana? There is a line here that if you've ever been adjudicated mentally defective, talk a little bit about that line. Um, well, it's, it's in there as far as people ha are required to answer it truthfully. Um, if they answer it falsely, we, we really don't know because it, it's not a link between this and the state police background check. So if they have been, they could put no, and we would never know it. So that line itself is based on the honor system? Correct. They all are. They all are. But, but can some of this information be checked, though? Right. Uh, more than now, others? like, uh, fidget from justice, if you, if you check yes or check no and you are, it will come up in the background check. But the mental health one doesn't show up. So if you are, or a person fills out this form, the state and the federal, then take us to the computer. Okay. From there, we go on the state website. We put all the information into the computer based off, interest off their form. We hit submit, and generally within 15 to 25 seconds, we'll get an approval or a delay back from state police. Approval is automatic. A delay could be anything from having a common name to maybe having government clearances um, or having a bad background check. But no one knows until the state police does their actual investigation into it. So the average time to find out if you're eligible is 30 seconds? 
Yes. Wait, is that standard or what's the what's the longest per period Long of time? Long about three months. Three months. The gentleman was had issues back in his in his past in North Dakota, and it took a little while between North Dakota and Virginia to get this clar clarified. Uh, had done 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 as quickly as eight minutes. So we're looking at a state website. Is there a website federally that this gets attached to as this well? Is all, I'm not sure. This is all done state locally. So this is just a state site right. that, you, that the background check is I am only concerned with, with Virginia background checks, yes. Um, tell us a little bit then, you know, the number of background checks you do uh, here at the Blue Ridge Arsenal. Um, in the past several months, we're averaging 10 to 15 maybe on mm -hmm. certain days. On um, weekends, we're averaging a little bit more. Again, like, like earlier, people are, are beginning to buy guns more because they're concerned about what's going on. So we're doing a lot more checks and a lot more sales. If a person gets rejected or bounced back, can he apply again? Um, I've had people who've been, who've been denied. Um, they're given information to contact a police to inquire as to why they were denied. Um, some things can be, can, can be as quick, easily as um, community variables and they, missed, they, they made a mistake and they were approved after the fact. Um, but each person is allowed to inquire on their own account as to why they were denied. And is there a cost for a background check? Yes, um, $2 for a state phone background check. $2? $2 per check, yes. So this is Mark Warner, walked you through the basics of the background check. Mark Warner, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Pedro, could you ask Mr. Warner, um, have they ever refused to sell somebody a gun even though they've passed the background check? Uh, host wants to know if the Arsenal or you have ever refused to sell somebody a gun even if they've passed a background check. Well. That's them used to beforehand. Um, I've had someone who, yeah, actually I have. I had someone who was delayed, and upon talking to her about why she was delayed, she really made me feel very uncomfortable. Um, she made some comments about her past life and having issues with um, mental health, as a matter of fact, and based upon that, I decided to go ahead and refuse to sell. Um, even though she was in the SKU and delayed, I still chose to refuse it because she told me after the fact that she had had some issues, and. I wasn't going to do it. So. And any of you on the staff can make that call? Yes. Back to you, Peter. And Emily Miller of the Washington Times is also out at Blue Ridge Arsenal joining us. Emily Miller, Liz Smith tweets in to you, Emily, I have a sweet Smith & Wesson bodyguard with a laser. This is a great gun for women. Aim that laser and hit guaranteed. Uh, are women owners, how common? is it to be a woman and a gun owner? Well, it's the highest ever right now, gun ownership of women. Um, and I think that's because women understand that, you know, 911 is a little bit far away. And, you know, it's almost become in a way cool now. You know, you'll see these Groupon offers or living social offers for gun, you know, classes and training sessions. And I'll just say, you know, anecdotally, since I got a gun last year, my girlfriends have, a lot of my girlfriends said they want to get a gun, they want to go to the shooting range. So I've taught a lot of friends to shoot for the first time, and several are thinking of getting guns for their own self-defense. And, you know, I think the society has changed for gun ownership, and that's why you're seeing ownership on the rise, because it is okay for women to own guns. It's not just a man's world. And I will say, I also tried that laser that she mentioned. I'd never used one before. My friend Mike Collins, who works at Sharpshooters Range, let me try his gun, and my, my aim was amazingly better using those laser grips. And a recent poll out on February 1st, this is from Gallup, 45% uh, of men own guns, 15% of women own guns, and regionally, if you live in the South, you're most likely, and if you are married, you are most likely to own a gun, 37% of married people own guns, not married, 22%. Jim in Cowan, Tennessee, please go ahead with your question or comment for Emily Miller. Um, well, on the comment, what I got uh, is the way I see it is every American does have a right to own a, a firearm. And if it's for a hunting, I can see using your shotguns and your regular rifles. But these uh, semi-automatics and fully automatics that everybody wants so badly, they're not on board. I was a four-year Marine, and how many of your average citizens really need an FK or an AK? I mean, the Marine Corps teaches you, the rest of the armed forces teach you one shot, one kill. This for home protection, I'd rather have a shotgun because the boom enough is going to move somebody's butt out of your house. I mean, you don't need to kill the individual. You just need to protect yourself and your family, but not. Emily Miller? 
Well, there's several sort of issues in that collar. First of all, automatic weapons have been fully regulated by the federal government since 1934. They're not used in crimes. It's not an issue. And just so those people who aren't gun experts or don't know understand the basics of how firearms work, automatic guns are the ones they use in war for suppression, which is you pull the trigger and it just fires until you take your finger off the trigger. All the guns in America, except for revolvers or shotguns, are, are, are not just America, in the world, modern firearms are semi-automatic. I mean, you pull the trigger once, one bullet comes out. So it just fires as fast as you can pull that trigger as quickly as your finger can work. Um, as far as, so, you know, the, and the, the, there's this fear of what, you know, the administration, Diane Feinstein, calls the assault weapon. And an assault weapon technically is what he originally referred to as an automatic weapon, which are not used in crimes. They're highly regulated by the ATF. Again, they're extremely expensive. People just don't, can't afford them. Um, and, you know, rifles that they're so afraid of, they call assault weapons, are rarely used in crimes in this country. There are about 11,000 people killed by firearm every year in America, and about 300 and some are by rifle of any type. And in, even according to Dianne Feinstein, who sponsors this assault weapons ban, there are about 32 killed with what she calls assault weapons. And just to make clear what an assault weapon is, it is a standard rifle, it is semi-automatic, but it has certain cosmetic appearances, and that's the political definition. So if it has things like a pistol grip, which just means you can hold the gun underneath it, um, a collapsing stock, which is a way to, when the rifle goes into your shoulder here, you can shorten it. Somebody like me, I'm five foot two. In order to shoot an AR, they you know, adjust it to fit me. So nothing changes in the functionality of the gun. Um, they, it, function, it shoots just like every other gun. And so there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, because of the language that's being used, but there's no functional difference in any of the guns that anyone's talking about. Emily Miller, where did you grow up and did you grow up with firearms? I grew up in Baltimore. Um, my father had a handgun for self-protection and actually had a carry permit, um, but it was not discussed with his daughters. Um, I found it one day, I was looking under seat in his car um, and saw the revolver under there and I you know as newly ex newly knowing this gun world I do suggest to people who are gun owners and have children obviously to keep it locked up but also to teach your children about the gun say you know this is a gun this is a weapon um, of self-defense you teach them the basics I would suggest teaching the basics uh, which every gun owner and user ever knows and it's first thing you're taught and you're drilled into it constantly keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire always keep it focused in a safe direction here at the gun range they're they're all shooting down range and know what's behind it so and i do think that you know i was a girl i think if i was a boy i'd probably have been a little more curious about that revolver under the seat um but you know you just don't that's how accidents happen is when you know not my father is going to kill me after this interview. <laughs> Not that he put us at risk at all, but um, you know, I I uh, I do think that you know there is there's not something to hide from children. Don't make it a mystery. Make it you know this is something we have in our home for self defense, and you know teach them the simple law. So if one day the kids start playing with it with their friends, at least they have the simple basic rules that we all use, every gun owner uses, and keep that finger off your trigger and keep it in a safe direction so if something does happen, nobody will get hurt. Four months, $435 in fees it took you to get your gun living in D.C. If you were a resident of Virginia, how would those two figures change? It would take me 10 minutes and zero dollars, or I think two dollars is the cost to do the FBI NICS check. So it was such a contrast as I was going through it because I live, you know, in D.C. It's a mile across the river, and that's why these laws are so ridiculous. You know, there's more crime and four months, and that's what these gun control laws are. And there's so many of these laws are being passed in states like Connecticut, New York, uh, New Jersey, Delaware. They're trying to do the exact same laws, and it's going to have the exact same result as we've seen in New York and Chicago as well, where you have to register every gun, where the government knows where every gun is, and you have to go through all these hoops, and it doesn't reduce crime, and it doesn't prevent mass shootings, and all it does is make law-abiding people more vulnerable. Whereas if you live, for example, if I lived across the river in Potomac, I mean across the Potomac River, I would have had a gun in, in, you know, a few minutes, a background check. I'm a law-abiding person. Take it home that day.
Monica Brady tweets into you, Emily Miller, I own a Glock 19 and an S&W MNP Shield in 9mm, both excellent, accurate and easy to aim. I am a CCH instructor too. Uh, do you know what the CCH stands for? Um, is it a concealed carry? I don't know what the H maybe, part is. Maybe that I'm is. But you finally found a trainer in Maryland. Who was your trainer? Yeah, in order to take that five-hour class that um, is no longer required by D.C., and oddly, um, Governor O'Malley in Maryland is trying to enforce it in Maryland um, right now, even though it was the police chief in D.C., Kathy Lanier, said it doesn't work and we don't need it. Um, I eventually, on my own, not through the police list of instructors, found a woman in Maryland, and A, it was a woman, so I felt a lot safer than going to some man's house, but she also taught out of taught the class out of a real storefront. She had a real business in gun training and safety, and so then I felt a lot safer doing that. Bruce, Summit, New Jersey. Please go ahead with your question or comment for Emily Miller of the Washington Times. Yes, uh, first, thank you for taking my call. One of the things that I found most frustrating and profound, at least it's just from my perspective, is that everybody's talking about how this issue can be or cannot be addressed through legislation, when I believe there's uh, two things going on here that you can't legislate. The first thing, uh, well, they sort of go along the same line. It's about truth. One is about truth with how you're responding with your emotions, and the other is truth with how you're responding with facts, trying to support a position. The first part about emotions is I think when you look at some of the killers out there, and I don't necessarily mean just the, the people in the schoolyards, you know, taking down 14 people. If you uh, find out where they got their mindset from, I think find, you'll frequently find that they uh, found validation not from video games but from other people. Sometimes from the, you know, the people even on these talk shows where they're talking about how the government's out to take their guns and subjugate them, and they get them all worked up. Or maybe you go into a bar and you hear two guys who both have restraining orders against them talking in violent language about what they need to do to their ex-girlfriends. And I think when the community overall hears people talking like this, the first thing we should do is point our fingers at them and say shame. And we need a bully pulpit to do that, including people in the media doing this. You know. I have heard callers on your show right now calling in talking about how, you know, they're so concerned with the government coming after them. I heard one of your callers say, I'm under attack. Come on, get real. The man's not that important. We're not out to attack him. This is, you know, some melodrama people are creating, and they feed upon it, and eventually people go out there and they want to kill or they feel more justified in it. And I think that's sort of, a, you know, being honest with yourself. And then the, the second part is being honest with the facts and values and how they eventually support a position. And that All right, Bruce, let's get an answer from our guest, Emily Miller. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure who he's saying is, um, is giving these threats, obviously, if it's a criminal. And um, anybody ever hears any criminal saying, I'm going to kill people or do something, they should call the police. No, Emily Miller, um, I apologize. It's some of our viewers who are gun owners who are saying, I am, I'm worried about my right to bear arms. Well, I think that's totally legitimate. And um, there, the, we have the President of the United States saying he wants to ban certain guns that have cosmetic scary features. He's saying he wants to ban magazines that have an arbitrary limit of 10 rounds. Um, this is going on, and we're having bills in Ma Missouri saying they want to confiscate guns. A bill in Washington State just got pulled that would have allowed the law enforcement to go into houses without the, without the um, violating your search and seizure rights and just taking your guns. It's happening in every state right now. We saw New York already has passed laws and Maryland is, is about to. So it is not an exaggeration to say this is the greatest assault on the Second Amendment that has ever happened in the history of this country. Emily Miller is joining us from the Blue Arsenal uh, gun shop and range. The noises you hear are coming from the range. The store is open. It's in Chantilly, Virginia. And you're hearing some of the muffled shots of people on the range. But our colleague, Pedro Echeverria, is also out there. I'm with Earl Curtis. He's the uh, owner of uh, the gun shop. How did you end up owning the store? How, how did I end up? Well, about 10 years ago, I wanted to get out of the IT business. And I decided something I wanted something that was non-technical. And um, I was I always shot guns. And I decided to purchase Blue Ridge Arsenal. Now, what's it like being a gun store owner outside of Washington, D.C., especially when it comes to federal policy issues? Well, I live in the state of Virginia, so Virginia is a very gun-friendly state, so um, it's a great thing, actually. 
And so from the federal government side, when you see proposals like the president's proposed on gun violence and you know some in Congress, how does that affect not only you, but your store and especially customers who come to your store? Well, it, it, it makes um, law-abiding gun, um, gun owners uh, afraid. Why should they take away their rights when they're not committing any crimes? So um, sales have been, in, have been up and um, uh, it was a good year anyway, but it's, it's been an even better year ever since um, the tragic tragedy in Newtown. Sales and interest, uh, especially after December, is that when they started to go up for yes, you guys? Yes. Uh, talk a little bit then about some of the things you pay attention to, you know, policy-wise. What, what gets your interest most of all? Um, well, you know, um, a lot of things get my interest. Um, number one, we already do a background check. Um, number two, we already have something that says, have you been mentally adjudicated already on the form? So let's take care of the existing laws that we have. Let's, uh, make, let's enforce those laws before um, we want to add new ones that won't work. Or Curtis, this shop has been busy ever since you opened at 9 o'clock. Tell us about the kinds of people who come in to take advantage of your store. Just everyday people who, want to, um, en who enjoy the sport, who want to practice, um, who want to, um, you know, basically practice uh, with their handgun. Um, this is a great sport and what we teach here is education, safety and awareness. So um, the people who are here are number one training, learning how to use their handgun and also enjoying the sport. I think our host in DC has a question for you. Go ahead. Hey Pedro, if you could ask uh, Mr. Curtis two things. What was the licensing process like him for to, be, to become a, a licensed gun dealer and what kind of security does he have at the store with all those guns in there? Two questions. One, what kind of licensing did you have to go through to become a licensed gun dealer? And what do you do as far as security is concerned? Here well, at the store? Uh, there are several things that we do. Number one, I had to apply for a federal firearms license to um, own this store. That was the first thing. Um, and in the federal firearm license, you have to show that you have a storefront. And of course, we do have a storefront. Um, as far as security, um, we have several measures around here, um, both physical and also um, internet security to um, handle things around here. I'm how not going to mention what we have as far as security. <laughs> how regularly are you visited by the ATF? Once a year. And is that always consistent? It is always consistent. Um, we have a good relationship with the ATF. We get calls and for traces and things like that. and. Um, I mean, we do our paperwork. We make sure everything's done. We are, we've also refused a lot of sales. So, um, yeah, they come by once a year. Number one reason you would refuse a sale? These guys, if they feel uncomfortable, um, we've had, actually had customers ask how to do certain things to a person, and we say, look, this is where this stops. As Earl Curtis, Earl Curtis, he owns uh, the Blue Ridge Arsenal. He's very gracious for opening a shop to us. Mr. Curtis, thank you. Thank you. Emily Miller of the Washington Times is also out at Blue Ridge with us. And by the way, Monica Brady followed up and says that CCH stands for Concealed Carry Handgun. Uh, so uh, Emily Miller, you were you had two out of three of those words ready, so we appreciate that. Um, anything you heard from Mr. Curtis that you'd like to respond to? Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear Mr. Curtis. Oh, interview. I apologize for that. Well, we're going to continue to no take problem. calls then. Patrick in Lewiston, Montana, you are on. Emily Miller of the Washington Times is our guest. Hi, good morning. Um, I had a question about, um, if, with all the talk going around about how they wanted to limit magazine capacities of handguns and rifles, um, would that be applicable also too should that shouldn't that also be applicable to the government as well if 10 rounds is good for the average american citizen citizen shouldn't 10 rounds also be good enough for the government emily miller it's a very good point it's a very very good point um yes obviously if the government thinks a state for example thinks that 10 rounds is plenty that a person needs to defend themselves and it should be plenty for the law enforcement and you've seen like a company called olympic arms in washington state had announced recently that it would no longer sell its firearms to law enforcement in New York State for that exact reason, saying if you don't think it's good enough, if that's all you need, 
um, those 10 round mags, we're not giving them to the law enforcement anyway. And, you know, it's just it, this 10 round thing is so arbitrary. They, there's nothing, the average shooting, first of all, has is four rounds go off. So it, it, it's completely invented. It's not based anything scientifically. It's just a arbitrary number and that's why New York arbitrarily came up with seven recently Governor Cuomo pushed through that law um, and you know it just it makes it sort of and it also makes no sense for as far as crime I mean a criminal in the streets or which is you know almost all the crime we've got firearms all he has to do is change his magazine first of all they're not going to be switching out their their say 13 round magazines for 10 round ones that's just not going to be happening obviously um, but even if they do, changing a magazine, as I said, I've only been shooting for a year, but I can change a magazine in two seconds. So an experienced shooter, a criminal can change. It, all it takes is a press of one button and put the new one in. It's, it does not change how many rounds you're going to get off. Emily Miller, did you bring your gun, your Sig Sauer, with you out to Blue Ridge? You know, I didn't, and I'm so regretting it. I did not realize there was a gun range here. Had I realized there was a gun range, I definitely would have brought mine and gotten and torn up a little paper. But I think I'll probably rent a gun while I'm here afterwards and be a little bit later to work. Um, so if you were caught in D.C. with your gun in your car, what's the penalty? Well, there is a federal transport law, um, and it applies to all states. Even though many states have more restrictive laws, they do not supersede the federal law on transport, which means that you can transport your gun as long as it's unloaded and cased and locked in your trunk between any place where you can legally carry and possess to any other place where you can legally carry and possess. So in my case in Washington, I can only legally carry and possess it in my home. So as long as my gun is unloaded in a locked box, I drive an SUV, so it just has to be in the far in the back. I can drive to the gun range. I can, if I have to stop for gas on the way, I can. If I, you know, want to stop to get something to eat, I can. But that is a law across the country, and there's a lot of confusion with people because states like New Jersey and New York have their own interpretations of it. And it's really unfortunate because I've done a lot of stories of people, especially veterans, who are legally transporting their guns. Local jurisdictions like D.C. don't know the federal law, and these people end up spending the night in jail and having legal fees before it's thrown out because of the federal law. So it is just good to know what the federal law is and you know maybe gun owners who are driving across the country might want to print that out with them take that law with them um, but again as long as it's unloaded and locked in your case in your car you can go between those two places if you were if, for example though if I were to walk outside my home with my gun and walk down the street or you know used it for any purpose and was caught um, I would face one year in jail and a one thousand dollar fine and I might add, D.C. is the only, is the most ridiculous, top off all their firearms law. Within their firearms law, they also have a law that your mace has to be registered. Just personal defense. I mean, they really have it out for women in D.C., which is terrifying because rape and sexual assaults were up 50 percent in the District of Columbia last year. And they force you to register your mace, and the violation, the penalty for having unregistered mace is the exact same penalty as a firearm. Again, one year in jail and a thousand dollar fine. So being a woman in D.C. means being a sitting duck, and it's really a shame that the city council continues with these laws. Emily Miller, if you were pulled over for speeding or anything in D.C., do you, is it required that you tell them you have a gun in the back? Very good question. Um, something I've learned from writing about a lot of people who this happens to, if the law enforcement, this is in any place in the country, if law enforcement pulls you over and says you have the firearm, you do have the constitutional right to say nothing, to remain silent. Even if you're doing it legally, you have the right because, like I said, there are jurisdictions that have different laws. They can't win in court, but they can put you in jail for a time and get you a lot of legal fees. You have the right to remain silent. You cannot lie. if You can't say, I don't have a gun when I do have a gun, but you do have the right to remain silent. And that's what Richard Gardner, who's a firearms attorney I work with a lot here, who works in Washington, does a lot of cases in D.C., always recommends that to anyone, you know, if you are pulled over, just remain silent if you're doing it legally. If you're a criminal, of course, you're not going to admit it anyway, and that's 99% of the problem. It's not the, the law abiding transporting their guns is not the problem. It's the criminals, and they will just lie. Are you a member of the NRA or Gun Owners of America or anything? No, I'm not. I, I, um, I, I support their efforts, you know, I, I believe in their efforts, but as a journalist, I don't think I should be a member of those organizations. Emily Miller is with the Washington Times. Emily Gets Her Gun is her blog series.
He's also an opinion senior editor at The Times. James in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Please go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, good morning, C-SPAN, and also good morning, America. Um, Ma'am, um, Miss. good morning also, Miss Emily. Uh, there is um, a couple of comments, and I have a, a question for you. Um, when I was um, pretty young, and I, I didn't grow up in the city, I grew up sort of like in the country. And when we saw a gun tucked under a seat or uh, any instance like that, we would be terrified as kids. We just didn't. We weren't raised to uh, go to the gun ranges like kids are today. And I think that probably part of this problem that we're having with these schools, you're teaching your kids to shoot guns at 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. I think it's wrong, basically. Well, I, I I'm, I'm not advocating. This no, no ma'am, I'm not, I'm not saying. Go ahead, James, and finish. I'm, I misspoke. But um, my other thing is uh, on the convicted felon that called in a while ago, he was speaking how he went out and bought guns through, uh, over state lines and what have you. Uh, I know he, he, he probably don't deserve one, <laughs> but um, how does he protect himself? You said that a convicted felon shouldn't have a gun ever. Okay, let's just say somebody broke in on him. Do you know what, James? We got a lot on the table. Emily Miller, what's your response to that caller? Well, I, I just have to say, you know, this as a society, we decided years and years ago that convicted felons should not have the right to, to lose their constitutional right to bear arms. And, you know, if, if they want to address that in Congress, I, I just don't see that changing. Um, you know, it's hard pressed to know what is in the heart of a convicted felon, and it's one of those things you make a bad decisions in your life, and there are consequences to it. Um, and one, just to clarify what I said about children, you know, a lot of families take their children to the range early, and I, I see kids at ranges all the time. Um, a lot of families have a long history of teaching their children to hunt at a young age and use firearms safely. I'm not encouraging families, and what I said about my own family, I just don't think you should hide guns and keep them secret. I think that by doing that, you create a curiosity this is just my personal opinion um, I think you sh if you are a gun owner in the home and you keep your gun locked up just at least explain to your children show it to them explain to them the basic safety what we all do again is not have your finger on the trigger have it pointed in a safe direction and know what's behind it so at least if they do get curious if they break into your safe or something does happen they will have all those safety things in place to prevent any kind of accidents calling on our gun owners line is Jennifer in Butler Pennsylvania Jennifer go ahead Yes, good morning. Hi. Hi, Emily. I, um, I'm a mother and a grandmother. I have two daughters your age. You look to be about their age. And I'm a member, a longtime member of the NRA and the Gun Owners of America. Um, I wanted to ask you as a journalist, have you ever seen or heard of a documentary called It's Either Innocence Betrayed or Betrayed Innocence? And I'm sorry, ma'am, I have not. Why are you asking that, Jennifer? Because um, I thought it was timely in that a couple phone calls that you took earlier, a man had called and questioned the idea that as law-abiding citizens of this country who have a constitutional right to own and bear firearms should be worried about the government infringing on those rights and, and posing any kind of a threat to us. And that documentary is absolutely amazing in that it, it documents historically with footage with facts with truth um, what has happened in the history of the civilized world when governments have gone in and confiscated the firearms and the ability of individuals to protect themselves well that's very interesting there's a long history and you know people should do the study and I, I, I would love to watch that documentary and I will I mean I've heard from people as of this last year that I've been started writing about this issue and been a gun owner myself and what what you know really hits home to me are the people I hear who are um, survivors of the Holocaust, children or grandchildren survivors of the Holocaust and they all say the first thing that the Nazis did was come, the first knock on the door, this is what I've heard the saying is the first knock on the door from the Nazis was to get your guns. Then they never knocked again. I mean, general registration of gun owners and you have all these, whenever there are dictatorships and they know who owns a gun, when to get a gun, they're going to take it away from you. And, you know, we can talk about self-defense and we can talk about hunting and those are valid reasons for gun ownership, but the Second Amendment was written by the Founding Fathers for the prevention of government tyranny. And that's why this objective of the Obama administration to register guns, which came out in a um, internal 
Justice Department memo, which I wrote about this week, Obama's real aim here, that the only way that this complete background check system would work is if we have a registration of every gun in America, of every person in America. And that is exactly the opposite of what the Founding Fathers intended to happen and why people own, should have the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Emily Miller with the Washington Times. Her blog series on her purchasing of a gun is called Emily Gets Her Gun, WashingtonTimes.com, if you'd like to read the whole series. She's joined us from Blue Ridge Arsenal. Ms. Miller, thank you for your time this morning. It's and been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.